So as Jim had mentioned, um, the statistics on business aviation safety with all the technology and with all the advancement that we think is happening in, across the industry, uh, to a certain extent, the numbers don't lie. And the number of accidents and incidents, they're not going down. Um, they seem to be only going up. And our insurance advocate here is going to be able to speak to more, speak to more detail on, on that subject. Um, but we do want to talk about um, what is available to us, what's happening. We want to have our, our finger on the pulse of what's happening across the industry and what can we do as FBO professionals, as operators, as people in the safety realm, uh, people in the technology realm. What can we do to bring our heads together in order to you know, bring maybe new solutions to an old problem? And the, you know, when we talk about aviation safety, at least when it comes to the FBO space, we're not talking in the traditional workspace safety. Thank you. Um, we're not talking traditional workplace safety. Uh, we we don't really see the the typical workplace injuries or the slip and falls or or that as we do in, at the same rates as other industries. When we talk about aviation safety and FBOs, we're predominantly talking about aircraft damage. If you ask any pilot, if you ask any aircraft owner or any aircraft mechanic, uh, especially when you talk to the insurance companies, the highest number of incidents, the most expensive, the most common, is aircraft damage. And that has not changed. And so, uh, again, we want to create this forum to kind of put our heads together across all these different uh, backgrounds and include you all out there of you know what we can do to um, apply maybe new solutions to an old problem. Uh, we do want to talk about safety management systems because Ever since 2014, uh, with the ISBOS standard that has come out, a lot of FBOs have, have jumped on the ISBOS standard. And that was, for a lot of FBO operators, that was really kind of the first time they had ever heard the term safety management system. And you know, with the FBO industry being structured the way it is, we don't have the um, licensing and uh, the regulations that apply to us that maybe apply to some other spaces. And so our Lack of, lack of regulation usually leads to a lack of education. And so safety management system was a totally brand new concept to many people, myself included. Uh, there was, you know, the, I went to one of the very first ISBA SMS workshops and most of it went right over my head. Even as someone with a lot of experience in the industry, I knew, you know, I know how to tow, I know how to fuel, I know how to do all that. But the language and the approachability of it, it seemed inaccessible to me. And I know that there's a lot of other people that kind of feel the same way. So we do have some, some people up here with some ISBA experience and with some other varied safety management system experience. And we do want to talk about that subject on how it is impacting our industry, bringing us a little bit more regulation within ourselves, some self-regulation, bringing data to the table so we can make better decisions and make our operations safer. So um, I'll hand it over to... Uh, Joe, if you want to kind of take over from there and uh, give me your thoughts on that. Well, we're never going to eliminate all aircraft damage, hangar rash, et cetera, from the ramp, but proper good international grade safety training and ISPA is the way forward to reducing problems on the ramp, reducing incidents and accidents. And since the advent of ISPA, uh, we certainly have seen a great improvement. But some companies find, particularly the smaller ones, is by quite daunting. There's a lot involved, there's a lot of commitment, there is some expense. And I've gone into various FBOs and done assessments, looked at how they do things and found that even their basic training systems just aren't up to muster. Uh, very often I'd go in and I'd recommend that they turn to NATA and employ some of their methods, some of their training methods as a step towards ISPA. And uh, on top of that, I'd have to say FBOs really, really have to look at their staff. How they take care of the staff, how they mentor them, how they hold on to them. A lot of FBOs just don't take their line staff as being a long-term investment. So I'm, I'm going to point that to Greg because um, Greg about the investment in line service techs and their view 
on the professionalism of line service tax and how, from the insurance company's point of view, that can impact your loss rate and the industry? Absolutely. So uh, the interesting thing about the industry is, as Jim mentioned earlier, is the only constant is change, right? Um, so our leader, Brown & Brown, talks about that a lot. Powell, our CEO, is that we embrace that change and we need to standardize it in a way that we can handle the change and stay in front of it um, so that we can leverage that uh, for your operations. So on the insurability side, um, for example, a lot of the carriers decided to remediate FBOs in what we call commercial general liability. Uh, simply put, it wasn't profitable. So from a macro standpoint, you've got about three or four billion dollars of insurance premium throughout the world. And unfortunately, we had a burn rate of 100%, meaning we were spending $2 on aviation-related losses for every dollar we were bringing in, which isn't very good for longevity of the industry, right? So if we work our way down, what we found is on the MRO and FBO side, um, general liability was not profitable. So hangar rash, um, misfuelings, for example, um, the general aviation record, unfortunately, is worsening. So. Um, we've had five missed fuelings in the last 24 months that resulted in a fatality. Uh, Jet A being put into 100 low lead type aircraft. Um, and, you know, it's hurting a lot of families too. So beyond just the fatalities and the bodily injury, we found that the property damage that was preventable, um, we had to remediate. So when I was at AIG, when we crunched the numbers, we found that we had to implement minimum deductibles. So you will see on your policies, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, 10, 20, $30,000, even higher options, so that the FBO operators have skin in the game. It was a way of forcing their participation in the safety culture. Um, that was met with a lot of resistance, but the positive that came out of it is we could focus on some standardization. So underwriters can size up an operation pretty quickly. They wanna be able to go in, check boxes, and understand within 30 minutes or less if you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong. Um, and it's simple as that. If you can't check the box of having a safety management system in place, a safety, you know, a published safety manual, and then have everybody trained on that within the first 90 days and have that buy-in of the culture, you're already paying about 30% more than you should be. And why I give you those numbers is we're just in Chicago at a large catering company and ground handling company that does everything from airlines to small airports, business jets, and other things. And believe it or not, I mean, of 30 million a year in revenue, they do not have a safety manual in place. So we hooked them up with some consultants, and for a $10,000 investment in hiring out um, a safety manual to be publicized, we saved them $50,000 in their ins workers' compensation insurance premium right off the top. So not only do they have a net savings of 40 grand instantly within 30 days, it's also greatly improved their culture, which we're now defining to increase tenure and the professionalization of a lot of their staff. So their tenure is only six months to a year. Everyone's feeling that, that pressure right now, right? Recruiting and retaining. And as a millennial, I will, <clears throat> I will tell you um, as a past charter pilot and everything else, um, I was really surprised by that. I'm like, well, why are you so surprised? I mean, you're not practicing what you preach. We've gone out to FBOs in the Midwest that had schedules that weren't ideal for their employees to have quality of life, family balance. They weren't paying the most in terms of hourly rate or providing those benefits. Um, but their competitors were, and they're beating them out of market share. So um, we wanted to be able to find all that and standardize it. So when we're working with like an X1 My FBO software, we want to partner with them and yourselves locally to establish a standard that can supplement your insurance application. So every renewal, you can come in and leverage your insurance program to make you more money, to become more profitable, and become safer. Because at the end of the day, you can be profitable, but if you're not safe and you're not enjoying it, then you know what's it all for? Um, so that's where we see it going um, from the insurance side. Underwriters, when you field them, they want to know that you're doing it right and reward you for that. So if we can take the data from a platform like X1, we can simply print that out and attach it to your application every year and show to underwriters like, hey, look at this box they're checking along with everything else. Leads for a short conversation um, and you're gonna end up paying instantly 10 to 30% more. So I know I just threw a lot out there, but um, th those are some key areas that the underwriters are looking for when in the past they just couldn't have that trust with the MRO FBO and CGL side of their portfolio. 
I think one of the, the important things you just were talking about is that there's some tie-ins, I think, of all these things together. Because I think today, I think most of us would admit that we've got better tools available to us than we've had in the past, right? We've got better technology. We've got better training tools through NATA Safety First. It's, it's, it's a much better product than it used to be. We've got, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people have developed their own standardization. We've got ISBA now available to us, although I would probably admit a lot of people in this room, um, you know, might be independent FBOs or others where it is harder to get that standard put in place. It takes a lot of work. It takes a, it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of, of uh, documentation and everything. Uh, <clears throat> but even, even with all those tools and those processes and procedures in place, I think it comes down to the people at the end of the day. The people who, who are employing, the people who, were, who are part of our businesses um, uh, really are the ones that conduct that safety. And so we can have the best training, the best tools, but if they only stick around for six months to a year, it's really hard to, to, to manage that turnover and deal with that. And I think that's one of the keys that, that Jim mentioned earlier and that you're talking about there is the professionalization of our industry. We have to change the way we think about our people in this industry. They can't be disposable. They can't be, we cannot be comparing the wages of our employees to what the fast food chain down the street is making or what the car wash down the street is making. At the very least, at least in my opinion, I mean, if you think about it, a, a, a tug is technically, especially electro tug, is technically a forklift by, by OSHA standards, right? So, and, and we're moving around multi-million dollar pieces of equipment in, an, in environments both inside and outside. We're asking people to fuel. We're asking people to figure out whether they're supposed to dis disconnect the tow links, whether they're supposed to pin the aircraft before they move it. We're asking them to know all of these different things the right kind of fuel to put in an aircraft, you know, whether that's a King Air or a Queen Air, uh, those kinds of things. And yet we want to pay them what they make flipping burgers at McDonald's down the street. And we, we don't want to create a, a, um, a professionalization. And I'm not saying we don't, but for some reason the industry over time has created this scenario where it's not a professional uh, situation where we're not paying them what a forklift operator at a warehouse would make. Right anywhere close to that. And so uh, and the flip side of that, if you take that down the road is as well, do our customers, are they willing to pay the fuel margin or the hangar rates or the things or the fees that it would take to actually make that business profitable and be able to pay the employees at that level? So we've got, a, we have to, I think as we start thinking about these issues, it opens up some real questions that I think we as an industry have to ask ourselves about how we're gonna operate, how we're gonna treat our people, and how we're going to actually get there when it comes to safety. And, and I think it comes, we have to professionalize the industry. We have to make it where people want to be uh, in the industry, not for six months, a year, two years, and see it as just a, simply a stepping stone to something else, but they want to stay a part of the industry for a long time and want to end up like guys like Jim who have been in it their entire life. And I don't think there are that many of those folks left anymore. No, there really isn't. So by show of hands, how many in here have an average tenure of two years or less recently or any line staff resigning with under 18 months? Has that been a struggle for majority of the group? I right, see one. Their hands three. going up and nodding going yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, if we're being honest with ourselves, right, you gotta you gotta also look at the outlying factors outside of aviation um, and insurance outside of aviation alone. We struggle, right, with recruitment and retainment. We're we're short a million people across the country. It's a fact. So we're investing in technology to fill that gap. You are competing with other industries for talent. Millennials, especially, they are not into trading their time for you know just any certain amount of money. They want to have purpose, right? So you need to create that purpose in your safety culture if you want to be profitable. Because you can't be profitable if you're not going to be sustainable. Um, and again, you're going to get those best insurance rates if they can underwrite you quickly, see you're doing things right, and that you can leverage this data and invest in your safety culture. Um, they're going to know you're doing it right. And I mean, I, I've just been visiting with underwriters the last couple months, um, come from that side, and that's still their number one frustration. Underwriting in aviation is very archaic, very resistant to change. It's very manual pen. So underwriters are judged by not how many dollars they deploy, you know, their loss ratio, but also top line growth and bottom line. So they're throwing out big limits for some of the smallest premiums in the world. And to put it simply, aviation insurance has not been profitable at all for the last 10 years. Uh, last year, a few carriers just, you know, made a profit and they're able to reinvest in it. But it's typically a service offering um, from other industries and specialty, whether that's marine, 
property and other things. So we have had some reduced capacity in workers' compensations offerings, and you're gonna see that impact this year. So we've had QBE and AIG pull out of offering aviation work comp altogether. That's gonna affect you and drive those rates higher as the supply is reduced. And they did it because it was not profitable in the last 10 years at all. So partnering with NADA, they have a work comp program, you know, with Older Public Aerospace and some others, the most preferential rates and those safety credits are given to those that are doing it right. You can check the boxes like uh, Sean was mentioning, so. I wanna point out something Craig said. Before, for the most part, we were all lumped into one group. We're at a point now where we can do better than that. We can, why should, if, if I'm running the safe FBO, why should I pay the same as the guy across the way that's not, you know, doesn't have wing walkers? Broke three airplanes last month. That's the way it's been. By leveraging these tools, leveraging the SS, uh, SMS systems, the data within those, learning management systems, data within X1, movement data. There's some stuff we're gonna talk about towards the end of this where, where we're gonna give you some really fine-tuned movement data, like really specific stuff. You go back to your insurance company and say, listen, we've moved airplanes 100,000 times this year and haven't broke one. And you have this data. You told them who moved it, when you moved it. This is our processes. We're at a point now where we can give the underwriters the information to really affect our rates. And you know, the fact that companies are leaving and they're not profitable, we need to be concerned about that. It's gonna cost us more and more money unless we learn how to manage the problem. And we're, you know, again, that's one of the things we're trying to give the tools. It's, it's stuff with the next one, but it's really these SMS systems, the learning management systems, using those tools to create that professionalized line service tech and giving that data to Greg and his underwriters is where we're gonna save. Yeah. So I'll pivot a little bit and I wanna focus on something that think everybody has mentioned so far at this point is safety culture, safety culture, safety <coughs> culture. Really, how do you accomplish that? Because we all want to tell our employees that we want to be safe and we want to reduce our accidents. We want you to be safe and things like that. But specifically, when it comes to creating a culture of safety, in order to do it effectively, it really requires a paradigm shift from the mentalities that a lot of us entered this industry with. Most of us, myself included, we were raised under the mentality of if you break something, you're going to get fired. And that is just, in this day and age, that is just unacceptable. We cannot continue to operate that way. And it's still happening to this day where people are damaging airplanes, which is going to happen. It's damaging aircraft is just, it's going to happen. But in the investigation, there's people who are still, we have to do the investigation and we find out it was this guy. Hey man, why didn't you say anything? Because I knew I'd get in trouble, I knew I'd get fired. And that is a failure of the leadership, which means it has to be a paradigm shift and the first component of a safety management system is management commitment. And that management commitment has to come from the highest possible hilltop. It, has to it can't come from someone like me, the safety director, it can't come from me, it can't come from a supervisor, it can't come from a line service manager, it has to come from the highest position within that company, the accountable executive in, in, the, in the actual terms, the CEO, the owner, whoever it is. That individual employee, they have to know that they are being supported by the highest levels of their organization in order to make safe decisions. And that message has to be conveyed early and often. Early as in from day one of orientation, you gotta hear it direct from that CEO or that owner, whether they're face to face or here's a signed written policy statement that is part of your onboarding process. They have to know that they have that support from day one. They have to know about non-punitive reporting. These are the only conditions where you're gonna face punishment. And negligence, gross negligence is usually not one of them because that's, that is, that's a term that just gets very subjective and weaponized uh, by management. Um, but Reporting policies have to be clearly communicated. Responsibilities have to be clearly communicated. And those, all of those authorizations when it comes to who's authorized to make what risk decisions, that message has to be communicated early and often. And, it, and again, it has to come from the highest levels of the organization because a lot of people on the ground level can have good ideas of what they wanna do, but we've all worked at places where the guy above me is not gonna pay for it. I know he's, I know he's gonna say no and we can't operate in those environments anymore because it's only gonna make things worse. Um, 
So I, I want to at least go, go around the panel and when it comes to establishing a, a safety culture, what are some you know, good first places to start or what are some tangible examples of, I can tell that this place has a good safety culture because they have this, or what's a good first step in the right direction? Sean, I'll start with you. Well, I think one of the key things, whoops, sorry, a little loud there. Uh, I think one of the key things is that it's part of your key values, right? Um, and it can't just be, I mean, how, how many have, have like key values, you know, some kind of a, a documented that, that when people look at your, you know, it's, safety, customer service, whatever, it's got to be part of that, but it can't just be, you know, a sign on the wall. It can't just, it's got to be lived each and every day, and it's got to be part of who you are. Your values have to be who you are and what you're living on a daily basis. And, and I think there are, again, there are tools, you know, whether they're safety meetings, safety teams, those kinds of things that you can use. But I really do think it comes down to ensuring that that non-punitive safety culture is part of it and and that's just it to your point it's, it's got to be got to be through people cannot be afraid of getting fired because then they'll they'll simply won't report anything you've got to have a culture where it's it's not only okay but it's it's expected that you're going to point out things even that aren't necessary i mean it can't simply be hey i had an accident and this is the problem no this is you, you want your employees to the point where they're actually pointing out hey, this could be a problem. This could be, you know, I see a potential issue with this. And so that they're actually being proactive. Um, we were part of a group within ATA, you and I were, were both on that, that panel, you know, that are, we were discussing some of the, the, these types of things. And I mean, you actually have to have some metrics around safety and safety reporting to get people to start, you know, coming from the ground up, get some of those ideas and some of those things that they're seeing out, uh, out of people so that they're reporting things. And you actually want more safety reports. And they can be very simple. I mean, I'm aware of one FBO that if there's a misfueling of even less than a gallon, that's actually reported as a safety report as a misfueling. And it's, it's, and it's not necessarily, oh, you screwed up, but it's, hey, what, what's wrong with our systems? I mean, you, you get into the root cause analysis and you start figuring out, well, what's making it so that we're misfueling even by a gallon? And it may have nothing to do with the human side of it. It may be a mechanical problem. It may be some other component of it that's causing that. But you have to know that information before you can do anything about it. And I think that's part of our challenge as an industry. We're not gathering that information and, and encouraging that to come up Again, there's tools that can help us do that, but there's also just simply a culture of communicating that information up and not being afraid to do that. And I think that's where the key, it all starts with that non-punitive culture and the rest of it comes, comes as, as tools and availability after that. Yeah, and you should also be looking to create competition for your business. Why aren't applicants fighting to work in the positions you're offering? So you already have enough problems with recruitment, talent sourcing, and other things. A safety culture is going to be a must going forward. I remember I only got into aviation because I thought, you know what, there's no other industry out there that can avoid, you know, the safety aspect and culture of it. I want to fly because I want to be included in an industry that does things right by people because there's so much at risk and so much at stake, right? I mean, thousands of gallons of fuel, misfuelings, maintenance, pilots, training. You know, you, you've got to execute and do it right. Otherwise, the consequences are pretty, pretty drastic. So if you can create competition by doing things right, leveraging your business, leveraging your insurance program, leveraging your safety program, you know, you're, you want to say you're paying more than your competitors are. And I can do that because we do things right here. Okay, we drive our revenue by becoming more efficient by using programs like X1 FBO and other things that give us that flexibility, okay? And then you can stand behind it. So you're not just putting out a job posting for line service tech, you're saying, hey, you know, we're looking for long-term commitment here, people that want to be a part of this culture and this program and the first thing we do best than anybody else is we have that safety culture that, you know, the accountability starts at the top, whether it's an owner or a CEO, whether it's private or publicly owned. I, I still think that component's missing in, in most of the operations that, that we see today. Um, you know, ask why underwriters aren't coming out and viewing it. You can do it virtually from your phone. Hey, come pick us apart every quarter. Hire a consultant to come in and just pick you to death, bare bones, so that you can identify everything before it becomes a problem. And that's the proactive approach that everyone's kind of looking for. So I don't know if you agree with that or not, Joe, but that's some of the... I do fully come back to what Jason kicked off with a small example. A number of years ago, I was asked at an FBO I was consulting at to review an incident. And I was asked by the guy who was involved in it because he was demoted. I went and I spoke to various people at the operation, peeled back all the different layers of what happened. 
went to the CEO and said, you need to fire somebody. And he said, well, who? The driver, the tug. And the guy had stuck a wing into a, a wall, a pushback. And I said, no, you're the CEO. You have to go. The responsibility lands on your desk. You show no interest in the training. You show no interest in what happens outside the hangar doors. It turned out that the driver, a very, very motivated individual, very clued in, had worked 17 and a half hours straight. His three wingmen were on the same double shift. They were all falling asleep. And that's how it happened. There was no safety culture. There was no interest in it. And we'll go back again what Jason said. It, it all starts from the top. There has to be buy-in by the highest authority in a company. But they then have to constantly work with their own staff to be consistent and interested. And they have to mentor them. They have to show them that they're going to abide by the same rules. Uh, in the same company, I got them to sign up for an ATA safety first. And they did. And the first person to sit the online program was the CEO and then the FBO manager. And that got them all off to a good start. It then meant that the management people, the people who were running the place, knew what was expected professionally of the people on the line. So they weren't asking them to do things that were plain stupid or thoughtless. Hopefully that makes some sense. Going to Jason's question about safety culture and implementing it, and one of the things I always struggled with in my FBO roles was making safety, stuff like trying to catch somebody violating an SOP, you know, malicious application of that to employees, but it was just talking about it. Like, I felt like I worked for a lot of companies that just talked about it. It wasn't, it didn't feel real. Our job here and what's, what, how, what really creates the culture is making it real. And it's, you know, having, making them part of it, not just, it's not just something I say, it's not a word, it's, it's actually part of what we do, it's how we operate. And these tools that are out there to do it, these, you know, SMS and that type of stuff, if you haven't looked at it, you should. It, it, we, we did something at Landmark, before this was, when this was first started coming out, we did some, they told their bases to, to like walk around and do analysis, find things. And we gave it to our employees. The amount of stuff that they pointed out, shocking. We had a, hang, we had a wooden hanger up in New York that we didn't realize putting that G5 in that back corner comes within inches every single time. Certain guys knew it and they were always aware of it and paying attention to it. We found out that not everybody knew that. And it wasn't that risk that was there to take out the tail of a you know, brand new 550. So that came up in discussion. We actually went up on that beam, painted it yellow, made it clearer, put some reflective uh, tape on it. it. It's simple things like that. It, it became more than just something, it wasn't, it became something you did, not something you talked about. That's really what drove that improvement in, in our culture. I think I would circle back to you know, creating the culture has to come from the highest possible office within the organization. And it has to be lived. I would say it has to be demonstrated. And that test is going to come the next time you have an incident. And you are someone, someone who reports something. You have to empower people and authorize them to make safety decisions. Um, and people who are new to the industry, people who are new to this kind of work, new to the organization, if, you're, if you are new, even if you have a lot of experience but you're new to a company, your, your first couple of days, your first couple of weeks, your number one priority is don't screw this up because I just gave my last employer some really bad news a couple weeks ago and I don't want to go through that again, so I'm just going to do what I can to just maintain. I don't, want to, I don't want to speak up. I don't want to rock the boat. Those are human factors that as organizational leaders you have to overcome. You have to over-communicate. You have to over-communicate that new members of your organization, they're not only important, they are vital because they have fresh eyes on the organization. When you give them that first initial tour around the facility, they're gonna see things that you might have seen when you first started, but you don't see anymore because it's just part of your normal landscape. The example I always use is, um, how, many of you, how many of you guys have ever had a chip or a crack in your windshield and you noticed it and you told yourself like, I'm gonna get that fixed 
and then you just don't. And then as soon as you, a friend sits down in your car, they're like, oh shit, you got a crack in your windshield. You're like, oh, yeah, thank you. Those are the new people to your organization. They're gonna see all the stuff that you probably saw once but forgot about. You have to encourage and over communicate to them that I need your fresh eyes, I need your fresh perspective because your fresh eyes, is not, they're not gonna be fresh for very long. So over communicate and empower them to report those things. And the demonstration of that culture has to come down to when something happens, an incident, a near miss, whatever it is, and they make that report that's hard for them to make, whether they're new or experienced or whatever. For me, from someone in my position, the most, the, the most powerful thing I can tell someone is, you did the right thing. Thank you for telling me, you did the right thing. Don't worry, we'll take care of this. You did the right thing. And that is, for me, the most powerful demonstration of your safety culture is someone making a hard safety decision. Even if it's, I'm gonna make this customer late because we're gonna move one more additional airplane to make sure we do this correctly. Hey man, the airplane's gonna be late. You did the right thing, thank you for doing that. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the customer, I'll take care of that, but you did the right thing. Demonstrating your safety culture is, is very, very important. Um, the other thing that, uh, that I want to touch on here, something that um, is a theme with what we're doing here uh, with the X1 approach, with people getting on board with X1 and stuff like that, is we talk about change a lot. We talk about how, how rapidly this industry changes and we have to be able to keep up with it. Um, We've all been the victim of, we've been on the receiving end of bad changes. We've all said to ourselves or heard, nobody told me that. And we've also heard or experienced, well, they made this change, but here's all the unintended consequences happening on the backside of that play that nobody forecasted, right? Another component of safety management systems, it's a, it's a small bit that a lot of people overlook, and this is something I had to educate myself on, is change management. If you read the ISBOS standard, it's just a one sentence. The organization must have a process to manage change within the organization. I had no idea what that meant when I first read that. My thought was, all right, we're going to have a meeting at 9. We changed the meeting to 9.30. Now I have to have a whole organizational change process in order to do this. And it had to be explained. I understood that now it's like whenever you have a big, massive change that affects the organization, we're going to change our scheduling. We're going to change our equipment. We just acquired a brand new customer, we, this or that, a brand new piece of equipment. Being able to manage those changes, being able to avoid the nobody told me that, and being able to forecast those unintended consequences is vital to your safety culture. So me personally, I took a leap. Um, I did some self-education. I paid a couple hundred dollars to get a change management certificate. It's usually offered by the same schools that offer, you know, Six Sigma type of certifications. Change management's usually kind of in that same bank. Um, I would encourage anybody in a, in a management uh, position or anybody in the safety space to get educated on change management, whether you want to go out and get an actual certificate or just buy an expired for dummies book from Amazon or something like that and just read through that. Just familiarize yourself with the concept of change management, which all it is is just pumping the brakes and recognizing, okay, we know we need to make a change. Let's make the case for it. Who is going to be affected by this? How is this going to affect them? We've identified who this is going to do affect. Let's bring those people in. Let's get their input. We, we anticipate that this is, going to this is going to affect you in these ways. Are we missing anything? Let's plan it out. Let's communicate it. And it's, it's very, very similar to five-step ORM of you know, identify, identify your risks, implement your controls, supervise, review, all that. So um, if anybody else wants to chime in about uh, change management. So who does it? Who has a change management process? Anybody here? Is anybody on an SMS system now as an FBO? We have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Well, and then, and also capitalizing on lessons learned, uh, one thing we're realizing is that we are missing certain aspects of the operation. I mean, starting with those two is clearly just the most important. But what we found out is through some of the insurance claims we've had lately, they're mostly unrelated to what you would consider part of your aviation operations, but that you can learn from other industries. So from healthcare, from COVID, the vaccines, a lot of unknowns there. We don't need to get into the politics of it, but we have had health-related issues that are covered on your aviation insurance placement. So the biggest one, incidental medical malpractice liability, you know, you might save the person and it might go really well, but do you have a process for following up with them 
seeing if they were okay? Are they going to come back and threaten your operation because you didn't treat them properly, even though you saved their life? Um, that was big for us on the EMS side. And I thought, you know, we went into one of the biggest training providers, a third party here in Miami. It's a client of ours. And we were going around the uh, simulators that they, they've rebuilt for a lot of the airlines. And they've had a couple incidents with pilots that have been vaccinated or not, um, having heart-related issues and other things where an AED was required to save their life. And you pretty much got a five-minute window. After that, the chances of survival go way down. And luckily, someone had an AED defibrillator in their car. They were able to save one of the pilots' lives. And after that, we were able to work with them to get AEDs installed in every simulator and training bay and classroom. But when you went around and toured the facility initially, there wasn't an AED in sight. When you've got five minutes or less, you know, that, that, that can be pretty scary. So thinking outside the box on some of those current issues out there that aren't strictly just your day-to-day -day operations in the FBO that could threaten your operation. Um, we've also had, and you guys might be able to test to this, um, some in-flight events too recently with medical events where people are coming down, emergency landings and things like that where, man, the FBO better have the ambulance ready to go, have them airside. Did you not let them on fast enough? Was it your fault? Was it their fault they didn't survive? Right, and, you, and a lot of times those covered as are sublimited. So those are things you, know, you want to think about and that leads to tabletop drills. You know, every quarter, some of our clients that really embrace the safety culture are doing tabletop exercises, not just with their underwriters, but with consultants, brokers. I know Millionaire and Jet Access both do those. So um, just some perspective there on thinking outside the box. I have a question, I think, for the entire group. Um, what you've mentioned a few times is information. The airlines have a system called ASAP. I don't know if, is anybody familiar with ASAP? You ever heard of that before? So ASAP is the airlines reporting system, basically. Anybody within that, within that group can report these incidents. So now they're not learning, the airline side of the business, not just learning from their own mistakes, from my FBO's mistakes. They're learning from everybody's mistakes. Things like, you know, the fact that could have had a defibrillator there if we had known about it. Until we have that incident, we're not going to learn that, that mistake. So my question is, we have, you know, as your technology partner, we have access to a lot of your information. Would, by, by a show of hands, if we were to implement something like an ASAP for FBOs, where you could report information. There's a lot of um, tools within ASAP that anonymizes the information. Nobody gets to see who it was. All that stuff gets wiped from it. But the lesson of the incident is there. By a show of hands, how many people in this room would be interested in an ASAP-like tool for the FBO business, where I could learn from everybody else's mistakes and not just my own? That's, uh, that's interesting. It, and, and it's something we're going to look at. Um, we, you know, that's... The panel that Sean and I were on was with NATA. Um, I think we'll continue to work with NATA to see if they, they can lead that, but we'll provide the tools and the technology to create that database so that you can learn from, I, I mean, that's, I'm a big fan of, I, I make plenty of mistakes. I do plenty of learning on my own. If I can avoid some of it and learn from somebody else's, I'm all for it. And that, you can share that data too. I mean, with your, like I said, supplementing your application, your carriers, I mean, it can be a win-win approach. I mean, insurance is a pretty frustrating thing to buy. Like, I've got my personal insurance I've got to buy next week, and it's all over the place, right? And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with some of the value on it. But when you capture that data, you buy it, and you show an underwriter that you deserve the best rates. And, hey, here's the lessons we learned. We're also sharing it with our competitors. We don't want to give away too much because, hey, there are competitors. But you, for the betterment of the industry, um, that's what we have to do. So, for example, underwriters now are putting on forums about, illegal charter um, or the incidental medical malpractice. I mean, the underwriters are, are happy to participate and buy in. Um, there is, you know, a lot of regulatory issues at the state level because that's where insurance is regulated. Um, however, everyone is already on board. So I think if we can, as a community, especially in this room, come together on that and really push each other and hold each other accountable, then you're really going to start seeing some of the results come through. Because uh, the carriers can then use that data and go to their management teams and say, hey, this is why you should invest in aviation insurance. This is why you shouldn't write it off. This is why you shouldn't pull out of work comp, for example. Um, and, and to capture that data, we're going to have to work with like a, a MyFPO platform to, to bring that data together in a simple way, right, that's unedited. And that's the beauty of an ASAP program. I mean, when I was flying for the airline out of Chicago, the resistance, 
you know, with your fellow crew members of even turning in an ASAP report, a lot of them weren't convinced it was completely anonymous. I mean, I ended up turning a lot of incidents in as a, you know, as a first officer that the captain didn't, right? And, and it is anonymous and it is um, something that they can't retaliate against you for. So I, I think that's just, you know, a non-starter when it comes to this, something you have to do. So Sean has experience with this. I mean, from, from his business, they do the, the operator side of the yeah, well, business too, so. Yeah, I mean, on the ASAP and focus side of things, yeah, using data, submitting it as a huge part of our business on the operator side of things. So it, it's interesting that, that the operators get it. It seems like the operators go first when it comes to a lot of technology things. I mean, look at ForeFlight, look at all these other things that we've created for the operator side of things, FOQA data, uh, ASAP, all those things, and we have almost, I mean, X1 is, is kind of one of the first to, to actually take that, that, that step from a technology side to be able to get the data, to be able to do those things on the ground handling side. And so I think we, I think that's going to be a huge part going forward in terms of, of managing the, the process going forward, managing change, managing uh, what we need to do with those kinds of things is having the data and the information we need. And it, it's got to be collective. It's got to be pulled together. Um, and, and, there, and I think there's both kind of the... The, the numerical or the empirical data, and then there's the 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 the, the, the just the, the the narratives are important. I mean, if we went around this room right now, we could all tell stories, and we're going to learn a lot from those stories. Actually, I mean, we've done it. I've done it in small settings before, and I think in this group, that's I think that's one of the deficiencies, frankly, in our industry. Uh, if you talk to a lot of industries, our our owners and uh, came out of the convenience store industry, and they often lament how often there was kind of industry data gatherings where people would share data across the industry, but we're all so secretive. We all kind of hold back, even when it comes to safety and whatnot. That's one of the changes, I, again, I think we need to make as an industry. We need to be a little more open. We need to be a little bit more conversational in forums like this to be able to learn from each other and grow and better ourselves, because I think the pie can get bigger. It doesn't all have to be competitive and us trying to slice the pie against each other. But instead, how do we get, how do we get better together as an industry? Um, it's going to help us when it comes to insurance. It's going to help us when it comes to labor practices, hiring, and all of those things can get better if we work together to do those kinds of things. And I think these are examples of that. Yeah, I, I'd agree. Sharing safety information to a forum doesn't have a downside. It will help every single FBO. The more information that goes in, particularly anonymous information, the more shared knowledge there is out there. And a lot of particularly smaller FBOs operate in their own microcosm and they're not really tuned into what happens in a lot of other FBOs. But if accidents are reported, if incidents are reported into a forum or some other place, then the information has been shared. Others can learn from it. So and there's only a couple of forums where they can do that. I mean, especially for the independent FBO operators. I mean, you know, if you're a millionaire, or you're us, or you've got a, a modern or a shelter, there's several in here that are chains that have multiple locations that can have sophisticated systems, but there's a lot of independent FBO operators in here. Uh, I was one of them for a long time. You're, you're by yourself, and really your connectivity to the industry is through the software that you, you have, so X1 being potentially one of those, or your fuel providers, and I know there's several in here. So those are really your connection points into the industry, and so how do we utilize some combination of those two things to, to help reach not just the larger operators and the chains that are here, but, but the smaller independent operators, because that really they have very few different connection points into the industry uh, the way that sometimes some of the larger operators do. So I think that that's critical as we go forward as well. So as the safety director, how would you, like if you had access to that, you got a report, and like, a, like our, our own FBO ASAP system, you saw something cross, came across your desk, information on an incident. How would you use that to inform your organization? Well, I would look for the, see what steps in the root cause analysis investigation has been done. And inevitably, because you know we are a chain, and even inside of a chain or outside of a chain, we're all FBOs, we all do relatively the same work. You know, We just wear different uniforms. Uh, we're going to find the commonalities of this could have happened here and this could have happened here. It could have happened to us. And beyond that, it just turns into communication, a test of your communication systems of how effective is your communication across your organization to get that information down to the lowest ranks and the farthest reach. Because if there are nuggets of knowledge and things to be learned and lessons learned and let's turn left instead of turning right, the people at that base where it happened to, they probably 
have already done all that, but it's the communication piece of getting that message out to everybody else. That's the uh, real test of how are we getting this information out. And so having effective communication systems, whether it's, a, you know, it, it, at this point it's old school, but a, a, a robust email system, a reporting system. And again, like I said, over communicating, not just saying it loudly, but I sent you an email and we have uh, other things that, you know, other pieces of technology that may be available to us. Uh, some people are, are, are big fans of using Safety Culture Eye Auditor, which has a lot of communication tools into it, a lot of other technology pieces. Um, you know, the, the most old school method is a read and sign on the cork board or something like that, of how many different methods of communication are we using across the organization to get this information down and out? Um, and not only when it happens, but are we incorporating this into our operations moving forward. When we hire someone a month from now, how are they gonna benefit from the lesson that we learned today? Is this being incorporated into our basic training, into our, uh, our onboarding, um, and our recurrent training for our people who are still here? So it, it really just becomes a, a communication exercise once, it's, once it comes to me. So we have a few minutes left. Um, what I'd like to do is see if anybody has any questions out there um, before we take our break. Anybody have any questions? No, no questions whatsoever. We nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Just, I mean, sorry, while people are thinking about the questions, I'll just go back to what Jason was saying there on communications, effective communications. I was looking at some communications on safety, ironically, at a railway recently. And their method was, as you said, clear, concise reporting via email out to everyone. But they went a step further. All contractors connected with them got the same safety briefings and safety bulletins on a weekly basis. All the contractors, subcontractors got it. They made sure that it was pushed out to everybody, even if they weren't directly connected with what happened. And it was a way of educating people on the sides how important it is to take into account all the safety measures that the main company was employing. Yeah, and I want to point out, you know, we mentioned a few times an outside set of eyes can be helpful. Um, we have a few here. Feel free to talk to them. We have FBO Partners, who's one of our sponsors here today. Um, that can come in, bring that outside, outside set of eyes. We have Joe McDermott with uh, FBO Global Consult. We have Kyle Eiser with their side here. So if, if I, we encourage you guys to get that outside view and take a look at your operation, not from inside, but the outside. And these guys are more than happy to help in that process. And I'll, I'll piggyback on that. And, you know, I'm, I'm primarily an operations guy. My brain is not wired to think in business terms. Um, but that's part of what I really enjoy about being in the position that I'm in is the safety side of the house is not competitive. Um, I, I've, I've heard stories from um, other... I, I don't like telling other people's stories, but I'll, I'll relay this one. Um, there's a director of safety at a West Coast operation who had an entire career in the military and helicopter pilot gets out, gets his first civilian job as a director of safety. And he tells his boss within the first week, like, you know, I'm going to go to the FBO across the field and tag up with their safety director and just see if we can trade notes. And his boss laughed at him and was like, good luck. They're not going to talk to you. And, you know, it was, it was unusual that, you know, in his prior job in the military, he could just call up a director of safety from another helicopter battalion in another state or whatever, and they would just talk notes all day long. In the private world, it's not so much like that. We tend to silo ourselves. We tend to siphon ourselves off. And I, I try to do everything I can to break those barriers down. Um, in, in the safety side of the house, I'm not competitive with anybody because I don't want anybody to get hurt. I think if everybody's safe, um, it makes everybody better. I think uh, Joe had mentioned that earlier. Yeah, I want our businesses to compete. Maybe I want that G5 to pull up on my ramp and not yours, but I don't want anybody to get hurt doing what they're doing. So I, I don't view this as a, as a competitive part of the business at all. I want us to be open and sharing, and uh, it's only going to make everybody better. Many years ago, I worked on a ramp with three FBOs, and it was very, very competitive. First competition altogether. But the rule was, once everybody went their side, everyone worked safely together. Landmark worked close with Universal, worked close with Signature. Once the people were on the ramp, if somebody needed help, you jumped in. No questions asked. Safety came first. When you got back to the office, all the intel you could provide 
was taken from you, and on you, you throw and got the customer. But once on the ramp, safety first.